Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for this book. Lord, thank you for the 66 books in your word, written by 40 authors over 1,500 years. Yet, Lord, like the garment you wore, Lord Jesus, when you went to the cross, they're seamless. They all work so well together because it's one author, the Holy Spirit. And so as we come tonight, Lord, we pray your spirit will be our teacher and our guide. We pray that you'll open the eyes uh, of our hearts and our minds, Lord. May we be moved intellectually. May we, our hearts be warmed and, and may we develop more love for you and others. And Lord, may our will be conformed to your image. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so grab your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy, and then I would like you um, to flip to Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. And the reason I want to flip to Matthew is I want to just give you some context about the importance of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the second review of the law, okay? So there's five books in what they call the Pentateuch or the books of Moses, Genesis, Beginnings, Exodus coming out of Egypt, the Exodus out of Egypt, um, Leviticus where they get the law and, the, and, and for the tabernacle which becomes a temple, and then Numbers which discusses their wanderings, <clears throat> and then they get to Deuteronomy. So it's really a repeat of, of those first four books, he's going to give us the law again. And an interesting thing is, is he does it to the next generation. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. The generation has died off, and now Moses is 120 years old and uh, doing really well. He said that he still had the strength of a young man. I, I don't know. We need to figure out how he did that. <clears throat> and, and he's about to give them the next generation, which may not have received it from their parents. He's going to give the next generation, here's what God wants you to do and how he wants you to live as you go into the land. So as we go to Matthew 4... I want to just remind you of an incident that happened before Jesus' ministry. <clears throat> Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he's in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And we have recorded three temptations where the devil comes and tempts him. And I'd like to just review those with you for a minute and tie this into Deuteronomy. So he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and then became hungry. I sometimes think the Bible says things a little tongue-in-cheek. I don't know about you, but after 40 minutes, I'm hungry. He had done it for 40 days and 40 nights. It says, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the, it's a, that's Satan, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Which Jesus could have done. He had the power to do that. And listen to what he says. <clears throat> but he, that's Jesus, answered and said to him, it is written, man shall... Not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, why are we talking about that? Because that's in Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's actually a quote of verse 3. So what Jesus is going to do is he's going to draw from the book of Deuteronomy and answer Satan in these three temptations with verses directly out of Deuteronomy. Next verse, verse 5. Then the devil took him to a, the holy city... And said to him, stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now what's fascinating is verse 6 is recording Satan quoting the scripture, Psalm 91, 11, and Psalm 91, 12. So Satan actually quotes the Bible to Jesus. Think that through, okay? There's a, a really interesting video of Sam Harris. I don't know if you know who Sam Harris is. He's a, one of the more well-known atheists, and he has quite antipathy for all religions, but he does speak out against Christianity. And in the video, he says, Christianity is a violent religion. And he says, I want to quote a verse from you, for, for you. And Sam Harris literally reads this verse to the people. And I'm going to read you the verse, and he reads it out of context, and I'm going to give you the context to explain it. <clears throat> this is why you need to know the Word of God, so you know when there's people twisting it. He says, Jesus said this about people who don't want to follow Christianity. 
Because Christianity is as violent as Islam. That's what he was saying. Luke 19, 27. Jesus says, These enemies of mine who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Did you know Jesus said that? And so Sam Harris leaves it right there. <laughs> okay, so that sounds pretty violent. Here's the problem. Jesus is giving a parable, and he's quoting the king in the parable. Those are not Jesus' words. It has quotation marks because he's using the words of the king. If you just backtrack, he's talking about the master who gave the, the minas or the minas to his servants. And it says, I'll tell you that everyone who has more, uh, more shall be given and everyone will have it taken away. Even those who have will have it taken away. And then the king says, but these enemies of mine who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. He's quote, that's the king in the parable. That's not Jesus saying that Christians should do that. Does that make sense? All right. So you take a verse, just like Satan did, out of context, and you twist it. That's what Sam Harris did. So he's totally not being fair to the text at all. He's making it up as he goes. Satan is obviously twisting the scriptures to Jesus because Jesus responds in verse 7 of Matthew 4. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, and notice Jesus doesn't use reasoning or logic. He just uses scripture, and he quotes Deuteronomy 6. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, right? So he's saying, if I jumped off here, I'm going to test God the Father, and I'm not going to do that. And that's Deuteronomy 6, 16. So again, book of Deuteronomy. What's so important about the book of Deuteronomy? Jesus is tempted by the devil, three temptations, and every time he quotes Deuteronomy. And it says, again, he took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their glory, and he said to him, said, Satan said to Jesus, all these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 6 again, and Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And in Luke 4, which is also the temptation, it says he waited for an opportune time to come back and tempt him. Why do we study Deuteronomy? It's the fifth book in the Old Testament. It's the one that Jesus, when he was tempted, reached back and quoted to Satan. You see, the Bible says that all scriptures is literally God-breathed, and it's all profitable. And when that was written in Timothy, the Old Testament was canonized. They had all the books laid out, and the New Testament was being written. Now, we obviously apply that to the New Testament canon, but the point is that a book like Deuteronomy has great life lessons for us today. And it's important that we understand it so as we process reality, we can see who God is and what he has done. So let's get into this. Again, happens over a month period. It happens to the children of Israel. There are three sermons that uh, Moses is going to give us. He's going to repeat the law to us. I just want to give you one more real, real key here. There's something that the Jews call the Shema, right? And they still have like little phylacteries or sometimes I've even seen it in Oakwood where people will have a little scroll on their doorpost because it says that and it says that where in Deuteronomy in chapter 6 let me read a little bit out of chapter 6 for you and then we're going to get in chapter 1 hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one that's called the Shema right this is something they repeat all the time this is one of the reasons why they struggle with the Trinity now we believe that God is one in essence and three persons. So this verse does not violate the Trinity, but we are monotheists. We believe in one God and three persons. Verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. When Jesus was asked what is the greatest commandment, what did he quote? Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. So this book is all through the New Testament. All right? Now, now, verse 9 says, you shall uh, write them on your doorpost of your house and on your gates. That's why they put the little scroll on their, door, on, their, on their doorpost, right? If you go to a Jewish home, even locally, 
and they're real, um, uh, like they're, they're kind of real orthodox, sometimes they'll have a little thing on their door, and you'll be like, what's that? Oh, well, that's a little, you know, copy of the law. All right, so let's go to chapter one, and we're going to talk about uh, the place they're in, the people, and then the promise, and there's a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to get through this so we can get to some time for questions. All right, so these are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness of Arabah, opposite Suf, and between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hezroth and Dizab. And it is the, <clears throat> the 11th, it is 11 day journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all the Lord had commanded him to give them. So it had been 40 years they'd been in the wilderness. They'd been walking in a big circle. He's now across the Jordan River in what we call modern day Jordan, right? Uh, land of Moab, back in the, Old, in the Old Testament. And he's going to lay out all these sermons to, the, to these people there, all right? Because they're going to go in the land. And then he starts talking about what the Lord had done after he defeated uh, uh, Sion, uh, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Asherah and Idrii. Now, Bashan is up in modern-day Syria. Uh, Sion is the king of the Amorites. We think of Ammon, Jordan. Okay, so that's modern-day Jordan. Across the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law, saying... So that's where he's at. So they're on this... They're, they're, on, they're, they're over there. They're all gathered together. And he's like, I'm going to review the law for you in this place. He said, the Lord your God spoke to us at Horeb, saying, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and set your journey into the hill country of the Amorites and all their neighbors in Arabon, the hill country, the lowlands and the Negev, and by the seacoast and the Canaanites and, and Lebanon as far as the great river Euphrates. That actually lays out the land that they're supposed to have, right? They're supposed to initially, the initial promise to Abram back in Genesis was all the way to the great river Euphrates, right? Now, they've never occupied that land. The West Bank is modern-day Jordan River. Uh, the West Bank to Abram would have been the Great River Euphrates. So there would have been a massive section that they would have inherited. They never did. The largest the children of Israel ever got for land claims was under David. Um, so I have placed the land before you to go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to their descendants after them. God had promised the land, the land that the current state of Israel is in, not all of it, but they have some of it. That land was promised to God's people. That land was promised to them because a people needs a land, right? And the reason God put them there at the nexus or the connecting point of three continents was so God could give them his, the law, they could live by the law, and everybody who traveled through the land and met and encountered the Jewish people would say, there's something different about these people. What's different about these people? They're God, okay? There's a really good book, which we read last fall for a um, book club called If You Can Keep It by Eric Metaxas, and he discusses in that book that America is unique because of the faith that we were founded on. And some people go, ah, it's just another country. Only question is, name an invention in the last 150 years that wasn't made in America. <laughs> like, if you start to think about it, you know what I mean? Like, it may be produced somewhere else, man mass manufactured, and maybe that's going to change in the future, but it was invented here. What made America a place where you could fail? Isn't that the American dream? You try and fail, try and fail, try and fail, and then you succeed? Isn't that the American? Why is failure totally acceptable in the American context? Because in the ethos of America, we forgive, and we have a God that forgives us, so we can try and fail. It's a lot different than a God that is always punishing us. So here he says, I, 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 I'm going to give you the land and you're going to go into the land, and he's going to talk about Joshua here in a minute. You're going to go into the land. And this is the land that's been promised all the way back to Abram. And you're going to take the land. Now, Moses never goes in the land. Actually, at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. 
and God buries him, and we don't really know where he was buried. But the significance of that is God told him, I'll show you the land, you can look at it, like you can, from the mountain, you can look into the land, but you will never go into the land because of him striking the rock at Mirabeau when he should have spoken to the rock the second time. All right, I spoke to you at that time saying, I'm not able to bear the burden alone. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, are this day like the stars of heavens in number. There would have been a million Jews that came out of the land of Egypt, okay? That's a lot of people. May the Lord your God of your fathers increase you a thousand uh, a thousandfold more than you are and bless you just as he has promised you. How can I alone bear the load and burden of you and your strife? Choose wise and discerning and experienced men from your tribes and I will appoint them as your heads. And you answered me and said, this thing which you have said, it is good. So this is talking about the fact that when Moses got the people in the land, out into the land, and they started journeying, that he was the head and he had to manage a million people, and when they had strife, they wanted to see Moses. And his father-in-law Jethro said, man, you have to figure out how to decentralize your power, because you can't deal with all of these problems, Moses. You can't address everything, right? So what happened? If you look in verse 15, so I took the heads of the tribes, because they were, had 12 tribes, they're all divided by tribes, wise, experienced men, he picked men, and point them as heads over you, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, of tens, and officers for your tribes. So what he did was he found reliable men that he could dispatch to handle smaller groups of people, right? So if there was a really big issue, it would get taken to Moses, but the day-to-day -day things were handled by the people that Moses had put in those places. And that's why in uh, 2 Timothy, it says, These things I've given to you, entrust them to faithful men who are able to teach also. It's like the baton. It's like Paul telling Timothy, I've taught you how to do ministry. Now you find people to pour into and have them go do ministry. And that's really been what the church has done throughout its history, is it's found faithful men and has passed that torch. And so this is what Moses is doing. He is literally dividing up the power so the people can be led by the officers of their tribe. And if I can just say this, one of the great things about this kind of decentralized thing, and we see it in the church, right? Local churches have local pastors and then local leaders in the church. And why is that? It's because as hard as it is sometimes to endure each other, okay, thank you, Jason's not here to say amen, like he usually would, right? As, as hard as it is sometimes to get along, because we all struggle with that sometimes, right? It's decentralized, so it's local, so you can deal with things among your own group, right? And you know, we're here, we love you, we're going to serve you, and we want to make sure that we can work this out. He says, I charge your judges at that time, hearing the cases between fellow countrymen, to judge righteously between a man and his fellow countrymen, and they would have judged by the law. That's how they judge. That's what righteously means. Now, <clears throat> between a man, his fellow countrymen, or the alien who is with him. So there's an interesting principle here in Deuteronomy, actually in the, old, in, the, in the Pentateuch, that everybody was equal before the law, which is kind of an interesting concept, right? Because in many cultures, even to this day, everyone is not equal before the law. And it's one thing that we have received from the scriptures. I'm not saying it's perfect in our country anymore, but at least it's a principle. Verse 17 says, you shall show no you shall not show partiality in judgment. Do you remember COVID? And certain governors would lock you down like Gavin Newsom. And then he went out and had a big meal with no masks at the French Laundry. And what did everybody say? What a hypocrite. He thinks he's better than us. Am I wrong? Where'd they get that concept? Why didn't they just go, he's like a ruler and he's special and we're not? Because it says you shall show you shall not show partiality in judgment. And that even means to the alien. You know, today in Israel, there are Muslim Arabs that serve as judges. 
that serve as university professors, that serve in the IDF if they choose to. Jews have to. Well, most Jews do. Some religious ones don't. But they, Jews have to. But the Arabs can serve if they want. So this is a principle that God had. When there are people that are in your land that is an alien, that is not one of you, you treat them with, you do not show partiality and judgment. There, that you apply the law righteously, which is fairly, to every person. You shall hear the small and the great alike, the big problems and the small problems. You shall not fear man, for the judgment is God's. So you apply the law fairly to all people and do not fear the person that you are dealing with in a case. The case that is too hard for you, you shall bring it to me and I will hear it. So he's telling them, if you get a case that's beyond what you think you can handle, you bring it to Moses. And this is actually a really good principle of leadership, right? You let people lead in their area of gifting, and you trust them to do what they're going to do, right? So even like, so, uh, you know, uh, just an example. I had a man teach me early on. When you're in ministry, you get the right person in the right job, and you let them do their job. So some people will say, like they'll ask me a question about music. And I'll be like, I don't know. Talk to Kate. She runs that. You know what I mean? Because she does a good job. And she goes through the lyrics and makes sure they're biblical. And if they're an issue, I deal with it. But until it gets to that point, you let that person do what they're going to do. And, uh, and it's a great way to get people involved and get them really loving and doing what they're doing with their, their area of gifting. All right, so this is the people and how Moses managed that million people in the wilderness, which is a really good principle. It's actually a principle that should be in everybody's mindset. And, and one of the problems we have as a country right now, if I can just say this, somebody told me, they said, you talk too much about politics. This isn't political. It's ideological. Here's one of the problems, all right? I'm just going to tell you. I don't think that Washington understands Ohio like people who live in Ohio. And I think when we became a nation, we tried to defer a lot of things to the states so the states could handle things on a local basis because they actually live among us, right? Somebody who very rarely comes to our state, I don't think they really understand it. I'm not telling you right now that I understand Wyoming I have never been to Wyoming. I don't know much about Wyoming except something about cowboys. And every guy wants to be a cowboy, right? But here's the point. Moses said, you're in that tribe. You're in the tribe of Naphtali. Those are your people. Divide it up. Judge justly with the law. Judge righteously. Judge everybody the same as in your land. If it's a big thing, bring it to me. If it's a small thing, and a you know, big thing that you can't handle, bring it to me. If, if you can handle it, you handle it, because those are your people. And so it's this interesting idea of, of kind of a local sense of loving and serving people locally. Which, so it's, it's really interesting. Um, all right. And then we set out for Horeb, and we went through the great and terrible wilderness, which you saw on your way, the hill country of the Amorites, just as the Lord our God had commanded us when we came to Kadesh Barnea. So again, he's kind of like replaying what had happened in the wilderness. Um, and I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, and the Lord your God is about to give us. See, the Lord has placed the land before you. Go take possession as the Lord your God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear, do not be dismayed. Now we're going to talk about what happened because they leave, they do the exodus, Right? They get out of Egypt, they get to Mount Sinai, they get the law, they're told to go to the promised land, they journey to the prom toward the promised land, they're on the outside of it at Kadesh Barnea, and look at verse 20, I said to you, uh, sorry, 21, see the Lord your God has placed the land before you, go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers has spoke to you, do not fear, do not be dismayed. Then all of you approach me saying, let us send men before us that they may search out the land for us and bring us back the word by, uh, of, of the way by which we should go up and the cities which we shall enter. 
The thing pleased me, and I took 12 of your men, uh, one man of each tribe. So this is when they sent out the 12 spies, right? And so Moses, they're at Kadesh Barnea, and they're like a million people, and they say, okay, we got 12 spies, one of every tribe. You head into the land, you figure it out, and figure out what's in the land, and then come back and give us a report. Now, what's fascinating, he says, they turned and went to the hill country and came to the valley of Eshcol and spied it out. They took some of the fruit of the land in their hands. And they brought it down to us, and they brought it back to us, a report, and said, it is a good land which the Lord your God is about to give us. So this all takes place in Numbers 13, all right? So you can read about it there. So they come back and go, man, this land's flowing milk and honey. The the fruit is massive. It's really a beautiful land, right? Um, Yet, verse 26, you were not willing to go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord. What did they do? Verse 27, you grumbled in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land uh, of Egypt to deliver us in the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are bigger and taller than we, and the cities are large and fortified, and besides, we saw the sons of Anak in there. Then I said, do not be shocked or fear them, for the Lord your God goes before you and he will fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you just as a man carries his son in the way in which he walked until this place. For this, you did not trust the Lord your God. So what happens? Well, the 12 spies come back and 10 of them go, Well, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, say there's giants in the land and the cities are fortified. Um, But God will go before us and win the victory. Now, let me remind you, these people were enslaved in Egypt, okay? So they're adults and they're enslaved. Moses comes out out of the wilderness at 80, because he came when he was 40 and was rejected. And he went and lived actually kind of in the same area that he walked them through. He was a shepherd there in that land with his father Jethro, father-in-law, pardon me. And he comes back to Egypt. He says, now it's time to deliver. And the Lord pours out the plagues on the Egyptians. And finally, with the Passover lamb, you know, the celebration where they put the blood on the lentils and the doorposts, which would have been kind of in the shape of a cross. Everybody who had a Passover lamb, the Lord, the angel of death, which was the Lord Jesus, passed over them. And the firstborn of their animals and their sons were spared. All the Egyptians lost the firstborn. So Pharaoh finally relented at at that plague, the last one, the last 12, and goes, okay, you can go. So they're, they're free to go. Then their overlords, who were they were slaves to, said, by the way, on your way out, take a bunch of our gold. I don't know about you, but that seems kind of odd, okay? Well, it's not odd, it's God, right? The gold eventually is what they used to build the, the tabernacle in the wilderness. So they get handed all this gold, and they're walking out of Egypt, a, a, a million of them, all right? They're all doing the exodus, and they're walking, and they get to the Red Sea, and they hear behind them, they hear the chariots of Pharaoh, strongest army in the world, and these people have no weapons, they're on foot, and the young and the elderly are in the back, because they're going to be slower, right? Obviously, the fit men are up front, so they're just going to get mowed over. And the Lord splits the Red Sea. And he actually tells Moses, be silent and watch me fight for you. They walk across the Red Sea on dry land, okay? Like, like, like firm footing. If you've ever been anywhere where water has washed up on a beach and the tide has gone out, when you step in that sand, it sucks your foot in. It said dry land. They literally walked on hard, like almost like concrete. They walked through. Pharaoh's still after them. Because he was like, I, I want to get my slaves back. I just lost a million workers. So he's coming after them. They get across through the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army gets 
on that same path that they were on in the Red Sea. And what does the Lord do? He closes the Red Sea up and kills Pharaoh's army, destroys it. Those are the same people that a few months later are at Kadesh Barnea. Now, wouldn't you say, do you remember that thing with Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea? Oh, man, that was awesome. What's God going to do this time? How's he going to take these? That's not what they did. That's not what they did. People sometimes can see God work in a mighty way and then not that much later can really struggle in faith, and that's what they did. So what, what do they do? They start to murmur the ten and say, they're giants. We're, we're going to literally die if we try to go in the promised land. And so this is what he's saying here. Verse 32, but for all of this, you did not trust the Lord your God who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to encamp, a fire by day and a cloud by night to show you the way which you should go. So that's the thing, is ultimately you have to trust the Lord. And they didn't. And you know what happens to that generation that doesn't trust the Lord, that says, we're not going in the promised land? They walk through the desert in a big circle for well, 38 years, it becomes 40 as it all plays out, for 40 years, and God said every one of them will die before they get to the promised land. So the people that are hearing this, which are adults now, their parents died walking in the wilderness. And whenever you look at it on a map, it's literally in a big circle, okay? I don't know, I don't know if Back in the day, before GPSs, I don't know if you've ever, ever been lost. Have, have you ever done that? I'll never forget. Jen and I, uh, we went to Montreal, and I um, get in a taxi, and this guy's speaking French to us, and I told him that I wanted to see one place, which was a hockey arena, the famous one for the Montreal Canadiens. And he drove us in the circuitous route, and it was, like, really expensive, and I paid, and I got out and realized... Oh, the train station's right there. <laughs> he realized, Americans, I'm just going to drive them around and make the money, you know. Anyway, it was, it was funny, right? I, I realized I just went in a big circle. Okay, good job, you know, Henri. Anyway, but, but the point is, in all of this, is that it was just a big circle they went in until they died off. And what's funny is they didn't trust the Lord, even though the Lord had showed him, this is how great I am and powerful I am, and I can do this. <clears throat> now, the Lord is also gracious because he's going to take that next generation in the promised land. He said, the Lord heard the sound of the words, and he was angry and took an oath saying, not one of these men, this evil generation, shall see the good land which I swore to your fathers. So that's verse 35. He says in, <clears throat> in Numbers, you guys are not going to get into the land. Not going to happen. You will die in the land. Except for two men. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. To him and his sons I will give the land <clears throat> which he has set his foot because he has followed the Lord fully. Now that's interesting because by the time we get to Joshua, what's interesting about Caleb is in Joshua 14, he's in his 80s and he gets into the promised land. And there were giants that they saw when they went in as spies. And there's hill country in the promised land, and there were giants living in the hill country. And he looks at Joshua, at, in, like in his mid-80s, and goes, me and my sons, we'll take that. It says here he followed the Lord fully. In Joshua, it says he was a man of a different spirit because he knew that God would go before them and, and take those giants out, take the evil out of the land. And they took the hill country. So it's in Joshua 14. It's a wonderful passage about Caleb. Uh, he he kind of plays a lesser role because obviously Joshua uh, is Moses' right-hand man. And then Joshua is the one who takes him into the promised land. But actually, if you ever want to read a little bit about Caleb and you go to uh, <clears throat> Joshua 14, it is a, is a fascinating passage about this man who followed the Lord. Because you've got to think for 40 years... He walked in a circle and watched his peers die 
who didn't have faith and didn't trust the Lord. And he trusted the Lord despite those around him. Okay, so you may kind of be surrounded by people who don't trust the Lord, who don't put their faith in the Lord. You can be like Joshua, be a person of a different spirit, right? Uh, be, in a, be in a church where people trust the Lord with you. Okay, um, sorry, be like Caleb, pardon me. The Lord was angry with me also on your account, saying, not even you shall enter there. And that's, that's Moses. He's not going to go on the promised land. Verse 38, Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter there. Encourage him, for he will cause Israel to inherit it. So Joshua, that's actually the, the word for Jesus in Hebrew, deliverer or redeemer, he's going to be the one. He's the one of the spies. And he's in his 80s at this point. He's going to lead the children of Israel in the promised land. And if you read the book of Joshua, that's what it's all about. That generation that were kids in the wilderness who grew up to be adults and their parents died off, they're going to go in and possess the land with Joshua. And what's interesting is, um, well, uh, we're going to get to it just in a second here. Uh, Moreover, your little ones who you said would become prey, your sons who this day have no knowledge of good or evil, shall enter there, and I will give it to them, and they'll possess it. So a couple things. The reason they didn't want to go into the promised land was they said, if we go in, our kids are going to perish, right? You know, you always hear that, right? What about the kids? Are the kids going to be safe? Well, God was leading you. If you would have trusted the Lord, which you didn't, he would have gone taking you into the promised land, and your kids would have been fine. So who died in the wilderness? The adults did. Who's going to now go in the promised land and possess it? The children, all right? But that was their excuse. You know, it's for the kids. It's for the kids. We don't want them to be destroyed, but they weren't. They were, and it says they have no knowledge of good or evil. So now they're getting taught the law because the concern is that their parents who died in unbelief in the wilderness didn't give them access to good or evil or the law. So now Moses is going to give them kind of, uh, you know those things called cliff notes? I know some of you are laughing. I know. I was such a horrible student. I wish I could go back. Um, Yeah, they'd be like, you're going to read a book? I was like, I'm going to go get the cliff notes. I remember when somebody told me, don't read books, Peter. It's too much fun to have. Just go to the store, and you can buy this little thing, and it'll tell you what the book's about. I was like, oh, okay, cool, right? And, and I, those don't exist anymore. You can just look it up on YouTube and get a synopsis. But, but the point is, <clears throat> um, Deuteronomy is like a synopsis of those first four books, which you can kind of see in chapter one, all right? So they're going to know good or evil because they're going to get Deuteronomy. They're going to get these three sermons. But as for you, turn around and set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, and that's what happened after they didn't enter the land. You're going to go walk in the wilderness. Then you said to me, we have sinned against the Lord. We will indeed go up and fight just as the Lord commanded us. Every man who gird himself with a weapon of war regard, <clears throat> regarded it as easy to go into the hill country. And the Lord said to me, say to them, do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you, otherwise you will be defeated before your enemies. So for those who kind of said, oh, no, no, we'll go fight now. He said, no, no, you guys don't trust me. You don't believe in me. And you've said you don't want to. I'm not going to make you. And and we think about that in Joshua after they were defeated because they had sinned. So they couldn't fight. So I spoke to you, but you wouldn't listen. And said you rebelled against the command of the Lord and acted presumptuously and went up in the hill country. The Amorites who lived in the hill country came out against you and chased you as bees do, and crushed you from Seir to Horam. Then you returned and wept before the Lord your God, but the Lord your God didn't listen to your voice or give ear to you. So you remained at Kadesh many days, the days that you spent there, were the days you spent there. So he's starting to just kind of review where they had been. And he tells them, Joshua's going to take you in the promised land, and you're going to, you're going to, this generation is going to see the promised land. But there are some interesting things here I think we need to, as takeaways, and I want to walk through those, and then 
I'd like to um, I'd like to open it for questions. All right. I'd say I'd say the first thing, which is is something that we need to always look back on, is the importance of having people close to you, right? Because Moses couldn't, as a central government, central governor, lead the people properly. He needed people that were close to him, right? So he needed people within the tribes to make the decisions. So one of the things that we all do is we all get burned in relationships, so then we start to shut people out, right? We build like a wall around ourselves. And uh, that's not healthy. And so what Joshua did, uh, sorry, what Moses did was he was told, get godly men, thousands, hundreds, fifties, to be in the people's lives, to know the people, to love the people, and to lead the people, right? And so, you know, if you're here tonight and you're like, I don't really, I'm not really, I don't really have that. But we have prayer on Friday morning. Uh, we have prayer Sunday mornings, 8 o'clock. Friday morning, it's at 8.30. It's a good place to get to know people, right? You want to know somebody, pray with them. Study the word with them. It's also a good place where you can kind of meet somebody that you can come alongside, right? Maybe there's somebody in the church you don't know well. And uh, I had somebody tell me the other day, they said, nobody in this church has ever endured the things I've endured. And you know what I said to them? I said, how well do you know the people in the church? And he said to me, not very well. I said, why don't you get to know them before you presume, right? Everybody here has a unique story and has a unique walk with the Lord. And everybody here is, is working to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. So get to know people within your fellowship. Love them, serve them, get to know them. And this is something that's fascinating because, because Moses literally empowered these men who were trustworthy, who knew the scriptures to speak into people's lives. If you want advice, there's a lot of bad advice out there. Find it in the word of God, okay? It's in here, all right? And so that's what Moses did that's how God's people were led. How do we apply that in our own lives? We need to be in people's lives, be in a position where we can point them to the word of God, to the power of God, to the truth of God. And, uh, and we see that in the children of Israel. I, I'd say another thing is that we need to be very careful of. Uh, we were all taught that we need to trust ourselves, right? Like you can think for yourself, make your own decisions, be your own person. Like, as Americans, we most greatly usually admire the self-made person, right? Let's be honest. Well, here it says, they didn't trust the Lord. They didn't trust the Lord. Well, you may say, well, I, can I trust the Lord? These people had just seen Pharaoh's army destroyed, and they chose not to trust the Lord. God says he's faithful. God says he's going to send anything that comes into your life, he can use it in a redemptive way to bring you closer to the image of Christ. Anything he sends in your way. All right? Uh, I listened to an interview last night, um, and maybe some of you saw it. Uh, there was a young lady who was taken captive by Hamas, uh, I think her name's Mia Shim, and uh, or Chem, or you know how the how the sorry how the Hebrews do it. Um, she she was taken captive, and then she was interviewed about her time being held captive by Hamas. And so it's all in Hebrew, and uh, so I was listening to it, and uh, with subtitles, and I was listening to it with a guy who's a apologist about Islam who's kind of discussing uh, some of the Islamic things that relate to her captivity, all right? So I'll give you the context. And she went back, and she's the one, I don't know if you saw it on, maybe on the media, she, when she was released, she got to her mother, and she wept like a, like a, like a baby. She held her mother and wouldn't stop crying. Uh, it's out there, it's all over X, formerly known as Twitter. So I would say this, watching that interview, this is what I found fascinating. She's very stoic. 
She's talking about what happened to her. And then she gets to this part, and she breaks down and weeps. And here's the part. She says, when she left, the other ones who were still held captive said, don't let people forget us. And she said, she said to them, I am so sorry that I have to leave you, that I'm leaving. And she had been shot in the arm, so she actually needed medical care. Partly that was part of the problem. So she wept that she had to leave those people. And so why don't we discuss this, right? Well, there's this sense that, that you know, we, we kind of want to live our lives and do our thing. And yet we look at the world and we say, the world's so broken. Who can I trust? You know, whenever I go vote, you know what I do when I vote? I hold my nose because I don't know that I trust anybody I'm voting for anymore, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but you know who I do trust? I do trust God. He's faithful. And God's people didn't trust him. He had proven himself to be faithful. They're in the wilderness. He feeds them. He gives them water. He gives water to all their animals. They didn't trust him. So I would say to you, make sure you're in people's lives on a close level, which we see that in this text. I would also say as a life lesson, make sure that you are trusting the Lord your God. Don't trust yourself, okay? Don't trust yourself. Trust in the Lord. He's the one who's going to take care of things. And, and I would also say, and I think that this is another good life lesson here, that, um, that we need to remember, that God rewards faithfulness. You got 12 that go in. They all see the same thing. When they come out, you've got 10 that go gossip and murmur and turn the people against God. And you've got two that say, they're not wrong, they're giants, and their cities are fortified. But I think and I believe that our God is bigger and stronger and our God's going to go before us. They were the two that actually saw the promised land, right? So I would say this, that God is faithful and he rewards our faithfulness. When we say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I don't really see how you're going to get this thing fixed. As a matter of fact, from my perspective, it looks like a dumpster fire. But I'm going to trust you. And just know that you have a good plan. And you're going to work it out. You know, I was watching an interview with uh, Phil Wickham, who I love. And uh, <laughs> he was like, He's such a funny guy, because he was like, yeah, I was playing music, and, uh, you know, people started to show up, and we were like, this is really cool, Lord, and I just want to lead people to Jesus, and, uh, you know, his, his uh, reach has really exploded, like, you know, he played nationwide, and he, like, he's playing stadiums now, and his interview, it was with this guy named Ruslan, uh, he's an um, Armenian dude living in California, he said, I just want to point people to Jesus. He said, that's all I want to do. It could be five people. It could be 5,000. I don't even care. I just want to point people to Jesus. He said, because God is faithful. And it's funny because as he has been faithful, Phil, as he's been faithful, God has blessed him. So I would say this. God will bless your faithfulness. It may not look like it this minute, right? But God plays the long game. So you've got to trust him. And when it's dark, he's going to deliver you. He's going to reward your faithfulness. You're Daniel. You're open your windows. You're praying. And the next thing you know, you're surrounded by lions. You've got to think. That's really not what I thought would happen. And the lions are laying there. And in the morning, when Darius comes, he says, Does the, the Lord you serve, did he save you? Daniel's like, let me out, man. <laughs> right? Think about how dark it was there. 
That's how it is sometimes in our Christian walk. You got this thing going on with the parent or this thing going on with the spouse or this thing going on with the kid. You know, they're sick or they're maybe not walking with the Lord or they're going through a struggle or any of that stuff. And you're like, man, it's so dark, Lord. But I'm being faithful, but it's still dark. You got to trust God's going to reward you. Caleb waited 40 years to get back to the promised land. That's a long time. But God did get him to the promised land, and he did take the hill country, and God did bless him. So I would say, make sure you're connected to people in smaller groups of people in smaller contexts. Make sure that you are trusting the Lord, and make sure you are always remembering God rewards faithfulness. The two spies that go into the land, Joshua and Caleb, are the faithful ones. And obviously Joshua leads the people, even though they were scared because of the Anakin, they knew that God was faithful. All right, let's pray, and I've given us a few minutes for questions. Okay, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Think about how faithful you are. Think about how even to this day, you've not left this world without a testimony. As we're in 2024, I think as we just came out of the Christmas season, how, how, Lord, people can't deny that it's called Christ Mass. And here we are, Lord, another year. Lord, we do not know what this year holds for us as people or as a nation. But what we do know is the same God that got your people through the Red Sea is the same God that gave the law on Mount Sinai He's the same God that got them to Kadesh Barnea and, told, and when they went in to spy out the land, had two men come out and say, they're giants and we look like grasshoppers in their sight, but our God will defeat them. Lord, help us not to listen to the voices of discouragement. Help us to have people in our lives that would encourage us in our faith. Help us to trust you, Lord, in all circumstances. And Lord, help us to remember that you reward faithfulness as you did with Joshua and Caleb. And Lord, as we continue to go through this re repetition of the law, may your principles that you've laid out in Scripture, may you pour them down into our minds and our hearts, and may they change how we live. And may you be honored and glorified in all things. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. I, we've got a few minutes. If you have any questions that you'd like to have me Attempt to answer. Oh, yes, Carrie. Ah, it's a good question. What's a good way to know if you're trusting or being presumptuous? I would say um, having a proper understanding of biblical exegesis. And, and I'll give you one example. And that's a, that's, that's a really good question. And I don't know that I'm actually up to answering it. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you what I think is, is a good answer. All right. Um, in Proverbs it says, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. Okay? Now, I've heard many people say, I took my son or daughter to church. And the Bible has a promise that if I train up a child in the way they should go, when they're old, they won't depart from it. Now, if you read it in the Hebrew, it actually is better understood. You train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, it, what the training, won't leave them. We emphasize that they won't leave the training. But it's actually that those life lessons that they got in the training will still be in their minds and hearts right? And they take that as a promise of God that the child they took to church will eventually come back to the Lord, right? Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray that they return. I'm not saying you shouldn't love them and point them to, I, I do all that. But we take it as a promise, and I think that's being presumptuous, because it's not presented as a promise in Proverbs. It's presented as an idea that the training you give them as a child will stay with them when they're adults. 
It doesn't say that they are going to come back, that they're going to return to the Lord. So I would say that we have to be very cautious with our biblical exegesis, because there are times we're going to be in a situation with somebody that we love and we serve, and they're going to turn around and walk away. And they may hate you, right? I mean, look at Judas. Jesus fed him and took care of him and loved him, and Judas was like, betrayed him. That's going to happen. So we can't say, it's not, it's not a mechanical transaction. If I do this and this and this, God's going to do this and this and this, especially when other people are involved. So we've got to be careful with that because I think that is presumptuous, being presumptuous, pardon me. So I would say, make sure we have proper exegesis. When I claim a promise in the scriptures, make sure that it's actually in there as I think it is with proper exegesis or proper interpretation of the scriptures, right? I can mention the Sam Harris, how he twisted it. I mentioned that Satan twisted scripture. We twist, we sometimes take something out of context and just cling to it, you know? Some of you have like promise books where they have like various verses, and I'm not saying those are always bad, but we have to be cautious because sometimes we claim promises that maybe God didn't promise us, right? Does that make sense? It's one of the problems with taking all the promises to Israel in the Old Testament and saying they all apply to me right now. Because they don't. They don't. Right? God didn't promise the church a land. So, so I would say that because when I look at Scripture, I have to understand there are people and there's people's wills, and I can't presume that they're always going to come back and follow Scripture as they should. So you may do all the right things, and I'll never forget a buddy of mine. He was an alcoholic. He was a womanizer. I know I have good friends. And, and when I met him, he was going through AA, and he was sober. And then he came to Christ. He started to like love and serve the Lord. And his wife told him, get out of the house. She literally kicked him out. And I was like, Ted, are you kidding me? He's like, I don't even know what to say. When I was a drunk, and I was, I, she, I, I don't understand. She gets kicked out of the house. And you know what's funny? He wrote me years later, and because uh, I, I met with him all the time for prayer. And, uh, and he, they lived separately, but they were married. And he kept talking to her about the Lord and loving her and serving her, right? But again, it's all her free will. And you know what happened? She turned her life over to Christ. And they started, they moved back in together and they started going to church together and they serve the Lord together now. But he, he couldn't say, if I just get sober and I come to the Christ, I'm gonna have a great marriage. Because when he did, his marriage was way worse. And one thing Satan tells you is, if you do X, Y, and Z, God's going to give you this. And then when you do it, and you don't get it from God, you start getting mad at God. God didn't promise that she was going to. It was about Ted. Ted's now saved and serving the Lord. But he paid for it with his, his marriage for years. And so, so I would say that we can be presumptuous when we think, if I do certain things, God's going to make other people in my life do certain things. They, they, they may not. They may walk out of your life. You just don't know. You know what I mean? So you have to trust the Lord um, to take care of you. And that, that one ended well. Um, they don't always end that well, but that was, that's, that's a good one. Um, but I'll never forget him. I mean, a man. He said, he, I mean, he came to me. He said, Peter, he said, where I work, I'm getting hit on by these women. I was like, really? He was like, yeah. He said, It's horrible. He said, I'm, he said, I keep wearing my, keep telling the women I'm married. And they say, but you don't live with her. And he said, but I'm a Christian man. And they say, yeah, everybody says that. And he said, he just, he just said, I am, I'm just giving it to the Lord, right? So I would just say that we get presumptuous when we think God's going to, you know, like a vending machine. I put my money in and I hit my button and I get something out. It's not like that especially when we're dealing with people. Because look at, look at Moses. Moses is like, we're here. We're going to go in the promised land. We made it. And then all of a sudden, Moses is spending the next 38 years walking in a big circle. 
because the doofuses didn't want to go in. Right? I mean, honestly, he spent from 80 to 120 walking in the, in the desert because of the people. So that happens. But what what he do in that instance? He stayed faithful. So just stay faithful. What you know? So I don't know if that answers the question at all. But make sure you have proper biblical exegesis. So when you claim a promise, it's actually in scripture, right? Because there are you can pull any verse out of context and make it mean anything. Daniel seven five, arise and eat much meat. That's one of my favorite verses. You know, for those who of us who like to eat meat. That is not what that means. <laughs> but I know that, but it's a joke, you know? So just make sure you do proper biblical exegesis. And then the Lord will lead you. But those are hard questions. Because we all have people that we look at that we love that are not walking with the Lord, and you go, really wish they were walking with the Lord. It'd be best for them, it'd be best for me, it'd be best for our relationship. But you have to just say, Lord, there, I leave them in your hands. All right, are there other questions? That's a good one, Carrie. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time in your word. Help us to trust you. Help us to be involved in people's lives, to be encouraged in our faith. And Lord, help us to understand that you do reward faithfulness like Joshua and Caleb. And Lord, to that end, uh, whatever situation each person is in tonight as they are here, I pray that you'll minister to them by your spirit and through your word, and may they leave encouraged, knowing that you bless faithfulness, that you want us to trust you because you're trustworthy, and that, Lord, you give us people in our lives to help minister to us and help us minister to them so it's not all about us. Bless us as we go. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.